Hey folks, David Stewart here. It's time to talk about one of my favorite things to talk about besides stories, which is game design and game theory. We're going to talk about games as a service, as a big umbrella category, and look at how games as a service are designed to part people from their money. And hopefully I can help answer the question, can you play a game as a service style game and actually enjoy it, have fun without losing your wallet or ending up in maybe an addictive spiral because these games definitely set themselves up to do some of that. Now, before I go any further with this, let me go ahead and try to define just a little bit what I mean by games as service. This is an idea that rather than buying a complete game and having it and playing it and then being done with it, I guess, when you finish the game, you are going to try to get the customer to pay repeatedly or periodically to continue playing the game. They're gonna pay more than just the first time around. They're gonna buy more things attached to the game. They're going to be paying additional times or be paying fairly often in order to continue to access the same essential gameplay. Now this goes really far back, even though it's gotten a lot of attention the last couple of years with video games, it actually predates the entire video game phenomenon by quite a bit. If you go back to the old war gaming days and you look at something like Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeons and Dragons has an early version of this approach to selling customers repeated access to the same game. You can buy the original Dungeons and Dragons 1.0 box set, and then you could buy additional rule books that go with it. And so the additional rule books are basically getting customers to pay to continue to access and get deeper levels of the game. Then you have modules that go with Dungeons and Dragons. Then you have subsequent versions, Dungeons and Dragons 2.0, 3.0, 3.5, 4.0. .0. There's even a, like a 4.1 or 4.5, 5.0. I guarantee you there'll be a sixth edition and a bunch of modules that will be updated that are from previous editions to go with sixth edition. So the entire idea here is that rather than people playing the original Dungeons and Dragons and just playing that, playing that game, they pay repeatedly to access the game in maybe just different angles, you know, different adventures with the same basic gameplay um, that they're familiar with. Now, that has transformed over the years in a bunch of different ways. By the time you get to the 90s, you have Magic the Gathering, which is an example of uh, what, what I would call a gachapon system or gotcha system outside of video games. With Magic the Gathering, you're buying little packs of cards to play the game, and you don't know what's in the card. It's a mystery box, or you don't know what's in the pack. You open it up. could be good cards. could be bad cards. could be cards you want. could be cards you don't want. What you're hoping to get when you open a pack of cards is something which will increase your power level, and it's going to be random whether you're going to get it. You might get a Black Lotus if you're opening an original pack, or you might get just a bunch of garbage and stuff like that. So um, Magic the Gathering is a great example of that, and a lot of its popularity and a lot of the fun surrounding the game is tied into that gotcha mechanic as well as the gameplay. So they went and ran with that. Not only is it random, but you come out with new sets, new expansions several times a year. So for people to keep up to date with the game and keep up on the power curve as power creep just kind of goes up and up, although you don't have those power nine really anymore with uh, standard play, uh, you have to keep buying more packs. You have to keep buying into the game or at least buying the cards that you want if you want to play constructed. And um, of course, if you're going to play like a draft style uh, game, you're you're counting on the uh, the randomness of the cards to be part of um, part of the gameplay. Um, as this gets transformed into the video game space, you have a couple of things that start to occur in the 90s. One of them is subsequent releases of what is essentially the same game. And the first, I guess, offenders of this would actually be um, sports games. Because you have like Madden, NFL, 94, 95, 96, King Griffey, junior baseball, 93, 94, 95, 96, uh, until you get to the early 2000s where the gameplay hasn't changed really at all from year to year, but the uniforms and the rosters are updated. Maybe there's a couple of technical tweaks, but you're basically playing the same game year after year, and you're paying to access that game uh, year after year. In the 90s, you also get the rise of expansion packs. Uh, this is especially prevalent with CRPGs, and a lot of RTSs had this, uh, but you had, you know, 
The Warcraft 2 expansion pack, Tides of Darkness, was expanded to Beyond the Dark Portal. You had MechWarrior 2 expansion pack, Ghost Pairs Legacy. You had expansion packs for um, all kinds of games in the 90s, and that continued through into the 2000s. So you ended up with Morrowind, which had a bunch of different expansion packs. Now, what are expansion packs? Well, now we'd probably call them DLC. They're a form of DLC, but what you're getting the customer to do is they're not buying a new game. They're not even buying a sequel with the same or similar gameplay. What they're buying is just more content for the same game. They're just paying to continue accessing the game uh, that they enjoy playing and playing it, getting to play it for a longer period of time. Uh, now, what people are really focusing on these days with games as a service is the um, the mobile gaming market because it uses a bunch of different things to try to get people to pay money to access the game repeatedly and over and over again. Uh, but with whatever the system it is, whether it's a video game or it's uh, outside of that, the point is to get people to pay periodically and pay often in order to access the same game. So. Uh, Let's go a little bit deeper. Let's talk about some of the monetization methods that exist in these. Now, games can use one of these or it can use several of them or it can try to use all of them. And indeed, the most profitable games are probably using several of these in tandem in order to get people to continue to buy the product over and over again without them really having to deliver something new or original. So I'm gonna order these in the list of basically more pro-consumer to possibly less pro-consumer or rather nefarious. So the first one is the subsequent releases like with um, like with sports games or Call of Duty. Call of Duty is probably the most recognizable uh, version of this, uh, especially starting with Modern, Warf Modern Warfare, which was Call of Duty 4 back in the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 days. And that one is notable because people really got into the online play aspect. So every single year, they came out with a new Call of Duty game. And even though you're switching franchises, you know, Call of Duty Black Ops, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, maybe Call of Duty Cold War, I think is gonna be this year's. It's basically an annual release, comes out at the end of every single year. People are going to jump off of the old version and they're all going to jump into the new version to engage in the multiplayer play. And in different years, they've also used um, several other things that are on this list, but that's a really good example. It just, it's a new game every year. And the reason that this is the most pro-consumer version of this is because it's really easy to exit anytime you want. And even though you might be inclined to buy the next Call of Duty game because everybody that you know is now playing the multiplayer of the new Call of Duty game, it's really easy to not. It's really easy to just not buy the next $60 game. There's an easy exit point uh, with subsequent releases. Same thing with sports games. Yeah, everybody's playing the new FIFA game, but you can always just choose not to buy it. It's, um, it's something that requires such a substantial investment in order to continue on. It's really easy to kind of step away. So, um, you know, those are the annual release games. I don't think that they're too bad. The next one is DLC. DLC, I think, is something that's fairly pro-consumer. It's optional, um, and it usually extends the game, offers players more content to play within the same gameplay. And uh, the reason it's not, you know, higher on this list is because it's not a very good value most of the time. When you play most DLCs, especially if you're playing with like an RPG, a Bioware RPG, you realize you paid five or $10 for what amounts to just like an hour of gameplay and then you're done with it. It's very disposable. It's often very low quality and it's really just there to milk people who are big fans of games. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of DLC and it's also one of those things where companies can extract different parts of stories or different parts of a core game and put them in DLC and basically ask people to pay more money for what amounts to getting the complete game experience with some games. So it can be used in a somewhat nefarious way, but because it's optional, because in most cases it's for people who really enjoy the game and the gameplay and they just want to play more of it, it's really not, um, not all that bad. And at the end of the day, if you're really concerned about the cost of it, you can just wait a while to buy a game and get like the game of the year edition that has all the DLC attached to it. And then you have the basically a very low cost option for uh, playing through that DLC. The next one, number three, is the all access or subscription method. This is what World of Warcraft uses, EverQuest and various MMOs. Now, MMOs have been really profitable in the past because 
Again, they get people to pay periodically $15 every single month to continue accessing the game. Um, now, I'm I'm generally a fan of subscription models for MMOs or games as service because when you pay the subscription, you have access to all of the content. It's all there. You can play any level. It may be gated by skill or power level and things like that, but you have the ability at least to at some point be able to, to access all of the content. Um, this is different from, say, DLC or something like that where you're starting to split player bases, you're nickel and diming people. You want to do that level, you got to pay for it, which Elder Scrolls Online uses more of the DLC thing. They use a kind of a hybrid between a DLC-focused system uh, and some of these other ones uh, like Cosmetics, which is what I'll talk about next, and the All Access one. You can pay for a subscription and have access to all of it, or you can just buy it a piece at a time. Kind of gives you some options as a consumer, which is not um, too bad. Um, but the problem with subscriptions is that they do affect game design because the point is to get people to pay periodically. If they can get through all the content in one month, maybe they'll quit the game and not pay you the next subsequent month. So the point there is to do a couple of things that I'll talk about with um how how these things are incorporated into design but you want to raise the power cap and you want to make the content big enough and take long enough to get through that players will play for a long period of time rather than just playing for a month and then quitting the game like they would with the traditional game uh, number four is cosmetics now i could put cosmetics as a less and nefarious thing but cosmetics actually create emotional attachment to games and make the player feel like they're a unique person and that um what they have in the game the way they look in the game the way that they inhabit a game with something like an mmo they have a unique identity and therefore they're not going to want to give that up so it can be a little bit a um, little bit manipulative depending on how you want to look at it but it's fairly benign honestly um, so it could be higher on the list but i just put it number four Cosmetics, this is just where you sell character appearances or weapon appearances or something in a game, and otherwise the game plays unaffected. Things just look differently. You see the guy on the cool store-bought mount, that's what you see. That's cosmetics. Number five is the stamina system. Now, now we're getting into the uh, monetization methods that are used really a lot by mobile games. So a stamina, um, stamina monetization has to do with you have to pay to continue playing the game for a longer period within, say, a day, within a certain time frame. Your stamina recharges in a day. If you want to play through a bunch of levels, you run out of stamina. How do you recharge it? You have to use like a stamina potion. How do you get stamina potions? You have to buy them from the store or use the premium currency which you buy from the store in order to buy the stamina potion so you can continue playing the game. Now with something like this, it's really playing into if you have a really engaging, fun game and you set the game up so that it's really fun to play for extended periods, then you start asking the customer to pay for that. They're not going to walk and want to walk away from a game that they're having a lot of fun with. They'll just throw in a couple dollars or they'll start buying premium currency in order to continue playing the game longer and longer and longer. This is a, one of the issues that people playing Genshin Impact, I think, kind of deep towards the end of the game are running into, which is this... Um, this resin system that basically boils down to a stamina system. You can't collect more than a certain amount of treasure in a day. So if you want to play for an extended period of time and really grind out a bunch of power and raise your power level quickly, you're going to have to find ways to recharge that resin. And that's going to involve going through their whole um, premium currency system and in order to eventually be able to do that. Number six is, now we're getting into things that are, I think are very nefarious. There's only seven of these. Number six is item sales or boosts. These are just selling power to players. Here's an item which increases the, the power of your player. Here's a, a stone that you can use to enchant your gear and increase the power of it. Here is an item that um, makes you more powerful, just straight up. So you're just directly selling power to players. This um, generally has a big negative effect on the overall climate of a game, especially a multiplayer and competitive game. People start to feel very inclined to want to pay to win. They want to pay for that power increase so that they can win people because it's very addictive to be able to have victory over other people. This has a way of affecting people who are effect who really like to compete, they feel competitive or they really like achievements and that sort of stuff. You're selling the um, you're selling the power directly 
um, through boosts. The other flip side of that would be, quote, saving time. It's like, oh, well, you know, I could grind out all of this stuff or I can just buy it from the store. So I could spend 20 hours grinding out the item or I can just buy it from the store for $5. What are most people gonna do? Their time is a little bit more valuable. They wanna do the fun part of the game, which is owning noobs or doing the competitive part. They're not gonna do the, they're gonna choose to skip the grind if they can and they are just going to buy the power directly. Number seven is gachapon systems or gacha systems. This is random rewards. This is loot boxes where you buy a loot box, you don't know what's in it, you open it up and it may be a bunch of items for the game. It's like magic cards. Now I put this, this is the most nefarious form of monetization for me and there's a few reasons why this is the case. First of all, unlike um, directly selling a power increase, you're only selling somebody an opportunity to increase their power. So the value isn't even a direct value transaction. You're not, someone's like, I, I wanna be more powerful in the game. I want better cards. I want uh, better characters. And you can just sell them the characters. In this case, you're only selling them the opportunity to get better characters. There's no guarantee. So the value transaction is highly variable. Not only that, but you're basically gambling. You're getting somebody to gamble. Pull out more loot boxes and maybe you get what you want. That is gambling, and people have serious gambling addictions. Gambling can be very addictive for lots of people because of the way that it um, affects our brain chemistry. So you have various kinds of reinforcement that are effective for both kids and adults. You know, you can reward behavior that you want. You can punish behavior that you don't want. You can combine those two, which can be very effective. But more effective than all of them is random rewards random rewards. If somebody does what you want them to do and they randomly get the reward, they're going to do that many more times to try to get that reward again. They don't know when it's going to come up for them. Um, it becomes very addictive. That's why people will sit down at a blackjack table and play all night in order to try to either win back what they lost or to try to stay ahead. Um, once they win and get ahead, they tend to want to keep winning and getting ahead. And then when they lose, they can never really cut their losses and say, well, I lost $50, time to walk away. They'll keep gambling until they go broke because it's so addictive. So gotcha upon systems. What are some, some games that use them? Genshin Impact uses them. I've covered that on this channel. Hearthstone uses them. That's exactly like Magic Cards. It's just a digital version. Magic the Gathering uses them, whether it's a digital version or it's a physical version. Now, the big difference between physical Magic the Gathering and Hearthstone is you can at least trade your cards with Magic the Gathering. If you choose to walk away from Hearthstone, it's like you lose everything that you bought there. And I'll talk about that's one of the ways that they get people to stay at the table. Um, but Gatchapon systems, I think, are by far the most nefarious and uh, ripe for abuse. Now, most mo mobile games, in fact, most games in general will want to incorporate some of these. Even a full price retail game, um, like we had this with uh, Star Wars Battlefront, it was like it had loot boxes. Loot boxes in a full price retail game. And, and consumers were upset about this, obviously, because there's this idea like if I'm paying up front for access to the game, shouldn't I be able to avoid these other monetization schemes which are annoying and from the mobile game market? And apparently the answer is no. But if you look a little bit more deeply, you'll see lots of MMOs use big combinations of these. So World of Warcraft uses um, a subscription model, but it also has subsequent release model too. It, it releases expansions, which everybody has to buy into, which make all the old content completely obsolete and pointless to play. And then it also asks you for a subscription. So it actually uses two at a time and it sells cosmetics from their item shop. And in some ways it sells power. If you buy a character boost that boosts you up to level 120 or now it's level 50, that's a direct selling of power because as you level up, you get more powerful. So they're selling you power or saving you time. So they do all of these things. They use three of these things at least. Um, they don't necessarily use stamina, but they may incorporate that into some of the some of the game aspects. If they start to incorporate things where like you can only play one character for so long without buying special items, then you know you're getting to um, you're getting to a little bit tougher place with them. But Gatchapon, I think, is the most serious. So how do they get people coming back again and again? How do they get them um, basically 
paying over and over again and refusing to walk away from a game. So the first thing that you'll notice with games as service is they have an increasing gameplay engagement as you go. When you start, the gameplay is fun. It's very easy and fun to grasp the micro level gameplay. So uh, Genshin Impact's a great, ex- great example. The micro level gameplay is really, really fun. World of Warcraft, the micro level gameplay is really fun. And just to, I've talked about this in other videos, you have micro, macro, meta. Micro is like the pressing the buttons. Macro is strategizing about things and meta is even bigger strategizing. Like how do I get the best equipment? How do I get the best set of characters in order to maximize my power? Um, so they start to increase that. So once you once you start and you're at the micro level, which is very fun, and you're like, well, this gameplay is fun. Then you move up to the macro level, which is going to be centered around, say, leveling up your characters in Genshin Impact, getting them to a higher level. And all of a sudden, they start incorporating some monetization schemes. So you can't level your characters through experience. Monsters, killing monsters doesn't level your characters up very well compared to a traditional RPG. So you buy the item boosts. You get them all kinds of places for doing different things, but they also monetize, monetize it through a couple of clever method, a couple, a couple of clever, clever methods in Genshin Impact, um, but they are monetizing that. And so mobile games will do that. As you start to play the game and get more into it, then they start asking you to commit some money, to start investing in the product if you want to keep playing and keep your power level increasing um, to a dramatic level. And once you get up to the metal level where you're trying to really maximize your power, basically it becomes that much harder to do. So you're going to want to pay to save time and do things like that. Um, So you start with a game that's free or low cost entry, and then you funnel them into parts where you're asking them to pay repeatedly. You're asking them to do that, um, do that thing where they're paying for the same gameplay. The next one, number two, is the investment mentality. The investment mentality really comes down to people not wanting to lose what they have put into something. I've put all this time into this character. I've put all this time into this game. I've put all this money into this game. I can't just walk around, walk away because then it's like I'm losing my investment. If you've bought a bunch of Hearthstone cards to quit playing Hearthstone, it's like I'm losing my card collection. I'm losing this you know, I spent a hundred dollars on my cards and I'm going to lose my cards. Unlike Magic the Gathering where you could sell your cards and recoup some of that. When you're looking at a video game like Hearthstone, you can't sell your cards and recoup the investment. Um, It's something that will keep you playing because you're just like, "Ah, I can't walk away from this. I dumped all this money into this game. So once they get you they ask you to invest, and once they get you to start investing, then you're not going to want to let go of that investment. You're want to, going to want to get some return. Oh, I put all this money in this game, and I haven't even gotten end game. Put all this money and time in this game, and I haven't even gotten up to a certain rank. Uh, you know, I have to at least play to get up to a higher rank in order to leave, even if you're not enjoying the game anymore. The next one is uh, emotional attachment. Emotional attachment can be very, very effective. This is what they do with cosmetics. My character is special. My existence in the game is special. I am special. My account is special and unique. I don't want to lose that. That's It has some sort of expression of who I am. So even if you don't enjoy playing World of Warcraft, you may enjoy walking around Ironforge in your cool looking gear that people can look at and talking to people, right? You have an emotional attachment to what you've done. You open up your bank and you see all your old gear from, you know, all your old raids. You're like, I can't, I can't just abandon this character, I've played it for 10 years. Uh, this is the character that I killed the Lich King on. It's the character I killed Illidan on. It's the character I killed KT on. I can't just walk away from the game, but it's not real, right? It's an artificial emotional attachment that they give you. So cosmetics buy into that. You are not going to walk away from something that you feel is uh, some expression or some part of yourself and your identity very easily. And they know this. Um, and the last one is addiction. Addiction is how they get you coming back is that high feeling when you roll the dice and you get something that's a really good item in that gotcha system. You get a really good character on your pull. You get a really good weapon or something. Uh, You roll the dice, you get a great item. You're going to want to keep rolling the dice to feel that even if you aren't enjoying the ma- the micro and macro level of the gameplay. And really, the addictive stuff tends to come in at the higher levels of gameplay, the, the meta level, if you will, where you're trying to get the best cards, have the best deck in Hearthstone. You're trying to get the best characters in whatever uh, mobile 
gotcha game you're playing. And so to get the best characters and get the highest arena rating, you're going to have to roll those dice a bunch of times over and over again. You're going to have to get the same character 10 times to keep increasing his power level up to the maximum amount. And it becomes addictive to the point where people are no longer enjoying what they're actually doing when they're playing the game. They're not enjoying that micro level anymore. All they want to do is to get some kind of accomplishment to feel, to get that feeling back that they've, uh, that they've been lucky and they've gotten something good. And they'll keep spending time and money on it until basically they go bust, until they really can't spend money on it anymore. So these things can be addictive. So with that in mind, can you play games as a service and have fun with them? And my answer is yes, you can, but you have to know yourself and you have to establish a couple things before you get into any of these, whether it's an MMO or it's Genshin Impact or some other kind of mobile game, a mobile gotcha game. Yeah, you can have a lot of fun with a mobile gotcha game. Absolutely, you can. But you have to know what you're doing ahead of time before you begin. So the first one is know thyself. If you're a person who struggles with gambling addiction, games as service models that use gambling mechanics are going to negatively affect you. And that includes World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft uses a gambling mechanic. Even though it, they don't monetize the gambling necessarily, the gambling is used to prolong your play. Um, because you don't know what item a boss is going to drop. You hope it's going to drop the item that you want. And you're going to be inclined to play for months farming a boss to get the item that you want. That's the way it works, right? So even though they're not directly monetizing it, it can still create addictive issues. So if you're a person who gets addicted to that sort of feeling and you've maybe struggled with gambling addiction in the past, games of service in general are going to be a negative thing for you in most cases. If they completely avoid chance mechanics, you're going to do a little bit better with that. Uh, but they like to put in a lot of chance, bonus loot and stuff, because it just it works really good at keeping people at the table. It keeps the addicts playing the cards all night long until they go bust. So know thyself. The other one is you have to ask yourself, what is my completion point for this game? At what point do I say, I have actually reached the end of the game? It's really easy if you're playing, say, Final Fantasy IX. You beat the last boss. That's the end of the game. Final Fantasy XII, you beat the last boss. That's potentially the end of the game, but you could keep playing like you could play the boss rush mode or whatever. But maybe you don't want to. So you got to decide before you play a game, what's my actual completion point? If you're playing World of Warcraft, when are you going to say, I finished the things that I set out to do? You have to know what you want to do ahead of time. Do you want to beat the last boss? So when you get to the last boss in the first raid, are you going to quit? Oh, no, because they're going to release more raids. They know this. They will periodically release the new content when people get bored or start to reach the level cap. Um, so they will uh, they will ask you to continue playing the game in order to reach the completion point. They're going to kick it down the line. So you got to decide ahead of time where your completion point is. Is it killing the last boss? Is it getting max level? Is it getting all epics, what's going to be your completion point. And then when you reach that completion point, you have to be able to say to yourself, okay, I've done what I wanted to do. I've I got an arena rating that I wanted to get. It's now okay for me to turn the game off. It's okay for me to cancel my subscription and play something different. So you have to decide what your completion point is. Um, one of the things about MMOs that they're very clever at doing is releasing content periodically. That's how they get people to pay periodically. The one of the things that they will set up is that 99% um, of the player base cannot reach the power cap. So the power cap is put so high that almost nobody can get at it. They do this with mobile games. They also do this with World of Warcraft. Um, with World of Warcraft, it was, it's not just the hardest level raid, like the Mythic Raid, getting the gear for the Mythic Raid. It's also, oh, you have to get the gear from the Mythic Raid and get it Warforged. So the actual power cap is pretty much impossible for anybody to reach. And that's by design. It's so that people will continue playing and playing and playing to try to reach that power cap. So if you're trying to reach the power cap, that's a very bad completion point. And if you're looking at, I want to clear all the content, they're, they're going to keep releasing content over and over again to keep you paying, to keep you at the table playing so that your completion point always gets kicked down the road. Oh, well, there's another final boss, boss another final boss, another raid to do, another extra set of uh, item levels to get. So each time they release a new raid in World of Warcraft, the power cap goes up. So as more and more people start to release, reach the power cap, they raise the power cap. That's what they do with these games you need to be aware of it. Um, so you have to decide what your completion point is ahead of time. The next one is what's my exit condition? How will I know that I'm ready to quit the game because I'm not having fun anymore? 
You have to uh, ha- take counsel with yourself and see where this is. I was talking to a good friend of mine the other night about WoW Classic, and he decided to quit WoW Classic after uh, like raiding in it for a year. And he had a good time, but he's like, I, you know, I was at a raid and the raid leader was yelling at us. And I'm like, I'm, I'm 36. I don't need this from my game. I play games to have fun. And I, he said, I told myself as soon as I stopped having fun, as soon as I could stop and ask myself, am I having fun doing this? And the answer was no, it was time to quit. So decide what your exit condition is ahead of time. If you're able to say, I just am bored with this and I don't want to play it, but I'm playing it to get something else that I want. If you're getting bored of the micro level and the macro level, maybe it's time to quit. Um, know what your exit conditions are. When, what, what will they do with the game or, or how will I feel about the game when I know it's time to quit? Because the entire point of these games as service models is to get you to, to never walk away. Make it as hard as possible for you to walk away from the game by doing all of those different things and making you addicted, raising the the power level cap. I guess that would be like number five on that list. Um, in addition to the other four that I mentioned, um, raising the power cap, um, trying to keep you invested in what you're doing so that you will feel like you're losing something financially if you walk away or you're losing something emotionally if you walk away, that you have some kind of unique identity attached to the game or you're just addicted to the feeling of winning loot. Um, That's something that they will will do to try to keep you at the table and you have to know what you're going to do ahead of time before you start these things so you know, when is it okay for me to quit? If I feel bored, that's a good time to quit. If you're playing Genshin Impact, maybe your your completion point is I just want to play through the little story campaign and then I'll be done. And I, I don't want to do any of the challenge stuff. I don't care about doing Spiral Abyss or any of that kind of stuff. Um, and that's a good way to approach it from there. So I know this has been a long video, but I wanted to dive really deep into this topic and just talk about it for people because it's such an omnipresent thing in video games now. It's infecting all the different game genres. And for me, it's really refreshing to play a game that has none of this, that's just a game on its own. Um, But it's really tempting because companies want to make as much money as possible and they can look over at mobile gaming and say, well, these methods work to extract additional money from more people. And you can even find whales, people who will spend thousands of dollars in order to um, in order to play a game, in order to get the right character pulls. Uh, somebody figured out that it would take an average of like $10,000 to get a max level Venti character in Genshin Impact. And somebody will probably spend that money. And that's kind of what they're counting on rather than selling a $60 game to as many people as they can. Um, maybe it works out to target those whales. More and more companies are gonna do it. You have to be aware of it. And um, you have to know that yourself if you're not somebody that is compatible or is capable of controlling yourself with that or is going to experience a lot of psychological discomfort or being upset by the presence of these systems, then don't start playing these kinds of games. So thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe and leave me your thoughts down below on games as a service and how they keep you playing year after year. Raise that power cap. As soon as the players get close to the power cap, we're going to raise it again. Everybody's going to want to grind out their new gear in World of Warcraft. Everybody's going to want to get the new characters. We're going to come out with some new characters that are even stronger than the old ones. New cards stronger than the old ones. Everybody's got to have Dr. Boom in their deck. You know, what do you think about those devices for um, in games? And do you think that they're manipulative? And is it something that you try to avoid? Or is it something that you're capable of having fun with even though they're present? Are you able to control yourself and control your um, experience with those kinds of games? So anyway, thanks so much. And I'll see you all next time.